A very warm welcome to this session on crypto and the consumer as part of the Fair Digital Finance Forum this week, where we look at consumer protection and empowerment from the consumer advocacy perspective. Our vision of digital finance is one that is safe, inclusive, data protected and private and sustainable. I'm thrilled that we have this session on crypto and the consumer, such an important topic, and also as Consumers International explores our strategy and work looking at the impact on consumers of Web3. Will it help us to move on from, a more, from more centralized platforms or will it exclude people? Will it create more risk? I'm thrilled to introduce uh, a woman who I know will help us explore all sides of these questions. Sheila Warren started her career as a lawyer. She has acted as general counsel at TechSoup. She has uh, been part of multiple NGOs um, and is on the board of a number of NGO and philanthropic organizations. Uh, um, focusing on social justice. Most recently, she was the deputy head of the World Economic Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, with a particular focus having founded uh, their work streams on blockchain. And she has most recently started as the CEO of the Crypto Council on Innovation. So with this background spanning NGOs, and business um, and really bringing together these different stakeholder voices. I am really excited to hear from her as she uh, looks at the situation across the world and how we build better. Sheila, thank you so much for being with us um, and the floor is yours. Helena, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here with Consumers International uh, to talk about this important topic of crypto and the consumer. We are going to be focusing today on the opportunities decentralized systems of finance can offer consumers around the world. What are the risks? What are the design features that are unique in this space? Uh, how do those create new opportunities? How do we differentiate higher risk products and everyday uses of cryptocurrencies? And lastly, a very important discussion topic on privacy. Is, is there necessarily a trade-off between transparency that the blockchain can provide and privacy uh, within consumers' uh, opportunities, which of course is such a critical point. But I'm joined today by such a phenomenal panel and I, I, I could not be more excited to jump in. So I'll briefly introduce them with the hopes that they will quickly explain a bit more when they first come on screen. Uh, Bennett Gordon, who's an independent consultant working with Better Than Cash Alliance and the World Bank, among others. We have Dante Desparte, who is the CSO and head of global policy at Circle. Danilo Perez, who is the executive director of the Center for Consumer Defense in El Salvador. Yu Kyung Ha, the executive director and legal counsel of Consumers Korea. Sean Lee, co-founder and advisor of the DigiX Node, and Rafe Mazur, Consumer Protection Director at Innovations for Poverty Action. So it is a truly global panel because this is a truly global topic. Uh, and without further ado, I'll kick us off by just offering a, a bit of a, a framing for all of you on a, what exactly is cryptocurrency? What are the main features of it? And the hope here is not to give you an overview, a super in-depth uh, glimpse into what this actually is, but to really just help level set so that some of the interventions that come to follow uh, will hopefully be contextualized for you. So, so what is a cryptocurrency? A cryptocurrency is a form of digital currency that is an exchange of value facilitated by a blockchain. And so I think it's most important to understand what exactly a blockchain offers that other forms and models do not. So there are critical features of a blockchain that I think it's clear to understand. And the, the most important of them, I think, is that a blockchain enables a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value. And what does that mean? I think the best way for me to explain this is to illustrate an example. So if I were to go out to dinner with any of you and I had forgotten any means I had of traditional payment, we might say, oh, no worries. You'll cover the check and I will just send you using our mobile phones whatever my portion of the bill might be. We might use Square Cash or WePay or Alipay or whatever it might be, whatever the favored um, medium of exchange, the medium platform is in our, in our jurisdiction. What happens then is that my bank talks to the application provider who then talks to your bank to ensure that the right amount of value is taken away from my account and credited to yours. 
And the reason we can both walk away from that transaction feeling confident that it's complete is because we trust our banks and the app provider to have a record that they are holding and that they are doing the right debiting and crediting. But let's imagine that we didn't have access to such a system, or let's imagine that we were in a very volatile world where we couldn't trust that the banking system was going to work for us for a, any number of reasons, which you can imagine. Imagine if we didn't need to have those intermediaries, the banks or the app provider between us, we could just engage in a direct exchange of value. Now we're all familiar with this. It's called me handing you some money, me handing you cash whether that's whatever denomination, again, in the jurisdiction that we're in, or we might even agree, hey, we're in Europe, but we'll pay in dollars for whatever reason, right? We have the option for me to literally hand you some paper and some metal and call it a day. We can now exchange in that same transaction in a peer-to-peer -peer way using a blockchain. We don't need to have those intermediary organizations that can control or gatekeep whether we're allowed to use their systems. Instead, we rely on a network of computers to provide the verification of the exchange we engaged in. Now, I won't get into details on something called consensus algorithms, but if you've heard of Bitcoin and Ethereum and other forms of these, one of the differences is how that network of computers works to verify the exchange of value. The important thing to note is that this exchange is similarly tamper-proof, censorship-resistant, meaning that no one can come in and change the record of what we've done, so it's equally robust. In fact, it's more robust, many argue, including me, than the intermediary and intermediated exchange of value that happens with banks. There are other features of a blockchain that, that people find very compelling. The immutability of the transaction is considered of paramount importance. That means that the record cannot be changed once it is created. And it's transparent in most cases. So we can see that my wallet, as we call it, sent some value to your wallet, the timestamp on when that happened in some cases. And then if you then send value to someone else, that is also recorded on the blockchain. So the increased transparency, transparency excuse me, in the system can in theory, if in the right enabling environment, provide more accountability. And this is something you'll hear from some of our panelists as being important in the consumer context. I'll kick off our panelists by introducing Dante Desparte to speak to, what about, uh, speak to us about opportunities for financial inclusion. blockchain networks. As we mark the conversation today of fair digital finance and financial inclusion opportunities. This is Dante Desparte. I'm Circle's Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy. Circle is a leading digital financial services firm and the issuer of a digital currency known as USDC, which has powered trillions of dollars of economic activity on blockchain networks. As we mark the conversation today of fair digital finance and financial inclusion opportunities, let me begin by outlining briefly where the analog or traditional brick and mortar financial system has fundamentally failed billions of people around the world. This is not an abstraction for me as I grew up poor and was the first in my family to get through high school or college. But the traditional financial system today has left more than 1.7 billion people behind. Access to the bottom rung of that financial system requires you to have an ID to satisfy a requirement known as KYC or know your customer. That adds on top of the 1.7 billion people who are unbanked or underbanked on the planet, a number of a billion people who have no method of achieving the bottom rung of the formal economy. And so in that world, how then do we reach the first of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is to eradicate extreme poverty when we have so many people who are left on the sidelines. But for digital transformation of the financial system and fair forms of digital finance, I think the world is facing a double jeopardy 
On the one hand, we're all talking about how to drive improvements in financial inclusion and to measurably improve the lives of people all over the world. But yet on the other, we're afraid of digital transformation. We are afraid of technological transformation in fundamental forms of how people are banked and what it means to be banked. I'm an optimist and an entrepreneur. I believe that if every internet connected device on the planet, something as low cost as a $30 smartphone becomes a part of a compliant payment endpoint, we could extend the perimeter of payments all over the planet in meaningful and sustainable ways. Digital assets, crypto finance, digital currencies are a part of this transformation, what some are referring to as the third generation of the web or the internet, where the first was the ability to write content, the second was the ability to read and write content, which has had transformational opportunities in how we've removed friction from information sharing and democratized access to knowledge all over the planet. The third generation of the web or the internet is the one we're in now, in which you could now read, write, and own digital content. Those, of course, must be trusted, well-regulated, and advanced standards of consumer protection and choice in order for them to scale to the billions of people that I just described. This animates Circle's mission as a company, and it animates my work as an entrepreneur in this space. It's an honor joining you today virtually, and I hope very much that the conference is a success. Thank you. Powerful words from Dante about financial inclusion, the opportunity here. And, and Sean, I'd love to turn to you now to just walk us through, you know, what are the opportunities for consumers with cryptocurrencies? And what design features of cryptocurrency are going to help accelerate financial inclusion in the ways that Dante described are so badly needed? Uh, thank you, Sheila. And uh, welcome everyone, all the audience from around the world. Um, I think the, the opportunity for consumers are really boundless. Uh, I, I, I'll probably start with the opportunity to be aware uh, of crypto to, to start with from, for, for, for the general audience. Uh, if you think about the, the notion that uh, this, this crypto you know, adoption is growing re really rapidly around the world, you know, with services like PayPal now, even, even uh, enabling for crypto buying, uh, I, I think a lot of the consumer friendly platforms are starting to really go that, uh, go that route. Uh, and then of course you see you know, companies like crypto.com making big splashes on you know, sports uh, sponsorships. I think all of that is really helping bring broader awareness uh, so, so the opportunity to be aware for consumers around the world has certainly increased a lot uh, over the last uh, year or, or, or two. Now, if you think about the opportunity to use, um, I was reading the other day the, the consumer adoption report uh, in, in 2021 that was done by uh, Cointelegraph. And, and this is one of the, the largest research going into kind of consumer use of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for, for shopping and payment purposes. The, the report actually shows that uh, crypto consumers are really scattered all around the world, right? Uh, and I think you, you covered a, a bit of that already, uh, Sheila, early on. Uh, they have varying you know, demographic features and are also from different um, social geographic uh, and socioeconomic backgrounds as well. But mostly they are, they're young people, right? Uh, as many of that is coming from the, the world's most fragile uh, economies and they see an opportunity uh, to participate in the global digital economy in cryptocurrencies. Uh, you have you know, immigrants uh, interest in, in crypto shopping. That's also quite remarkable now uh, due to the easier remittances uh, possibility in crypto. Uh, and then of course, those of us that are living in developed markets, uh, you often see you know, opportunities where you can invest in crypto uh, via uh, any type of uh, products that are being offered uh, in, in our economies. But at the same time, really, uh, you know, the, the, the opportunity to, to use it uh, for everyday work as well. So I think the, the opportunity to use has certainly grown, grown leaps and bounds uh, over the last uh, year or two. What's probably lacking, though, is broader education that, so that more people actually know, know, know about it. I, I think, uh, you know, if you hear a lot of the things that mass media is talking about in terms of cryptocurrencies, very often is quite uh, negative. Um, you know, it go from kind of energy usage to uh, to now, of course, uh, you know about sanctions and whatnot. But haven't really focused enough about the the positive usage uh, of crypto uh, and and everything else um, that that we talked about. So, I think the like I said uh, to conclude, I think the opportunity is boundless uh, for consumers uh, nowadays. Uh, it just takes um, someone you know some time to actually take a look at it. 
uh, and see what products and services may make sense for them. Thank you so much, Sean. You make such a great point that, of course, cryptocurrency is not a monolithic space. There are different design features uh, that do provide different opportunities, but also, of course, different challenges and risks. And so let's turn to that side for a bit. And, and Bennett, we'll start with you. I'd like to understand, just from your perspective, what are the risks for consumers about this, this uh, new class? And do decentralized systems you know, facilitate greater privacy as an improvement potentially? Or is there a trade-off between privacy and transparency and accountability uh, that, that you're seeing? We'd love to get your thoughts on, on these topics. Yeah, it's a complicated question. There's a lot of things to unpack there. Um, when I was uh, when I was in my finance 101 courses, they, they taught that there's a that there's a relationship between risk and reward. That um, you can't have uh, too much reward without taking on more risk. And in the crypto economy, we're seeing people making ten thousand, you know, thousands of times over in terms of reward. And so, to me, that indicates that there's a commensurate amount of risk. Um, a lot of times, these these crypto assets are being treated like securities, um, where, but the fact is that there aren't the government protections that normal securities may take on. And so to me, that indicates that there's quite a bit of risk involved in a lot of these, um, in a lot of these crypto products that maybe that, that don't have a, uh, that aren't fully clear to a lot of the consumers that are out there. Thank you, Bennett. I think that's a really helpful uh, place to start. And, and Yu Kyung, I'd love to turn to you with a similar question, your perspective on, on what are some of the maybe uh, downsides or potential challenges at this moment in time for consumers? And then also just touching on this privacy question. And is there this trade-off between privacy and transparency as a general matter? And is that amplified in some way in the cryptocurrency space in your view? Um, thank you. So um, I come from a consumer advocacy perspective from Consumers Korea, which is a consumer advocacy organization in Korea. So um, I would like to touch upon, like Bennett commented that the, the crypto is treated as an investment, like a securities like investment in Korea. So it's not used as a payment technology or as a currency. So what we, what we mostly see is people in their like 30s or 40s and engaging into um, investment of penny stock like crypto um, in this space. So we see a crypto craze um, fever or Bitcoin zombies in Korea. And to just show you the magnitude of the, um, the, the market is 15 million Koreans. In other words, about one third of the adult population have a crypto um, exchange account. And um, among them about five or 6 million, which is about 10th of the population are actually investing in cryptocurrencies um, in Korea. So, so, and the daily trading volume also exceeds our normal um, stock exchange, the KRX. So we have a huge uh, potential issue here, but um, I believe that the risk in crypto doesn't come from the underlying blockchain technology itself, but based on the, um, the attitudes of the invest investors in this field, we find that the weakest link in the technology is actually the human beings, the humans that run the companies, the humans that um, run the exchanges, and in many cases, the investors themselves. So what we see is that another big source is that um, the lack of utter lack of consumer protection regulations in this space, investor protection, and the crypto ecosystem, what we see in Korea is that there it's less developed in terms of legal and regulatory protections, and especially um, in terms of redress mechanisms, consumer complaint mechanisms, the customer service um, is crappy in the um, crypto exchanges. So we ha I have a huge list of risks that I would like to discuss, but um, I think I'd run out of time. So I will address them in the um, future um, answers discussions later. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Kyung. And then we'll turn over to Rafe uh, to round out this, this uh, particular intervention. It's of course, an uh, interesting point you make, Yu Kyung. It's a, it's a critical point that no technology is going to change human behavior. It can incentivize certain kinds of actions and it can dis disincentivize certain other kinds of actions, but human behavior is going to make use of any technological innovation, uh, what it chooses to do. And so part of the role of policy, of course, is creating that incentive path to ensure that pro-social behavior is encouraged and antisocial behavior is discouraged. But Rafe, let's hand it over to you to talk about this in the context of innovation to poverty action, please.
sorry, I really, oh, I'm muted. Is that better? Yes, thank you, Rafe. Okay, so um, don't dock that time, please. Uh, so I, I was um, saying that we, um, so we survey and do research with consumers in Africa and South Asia, looking at people who have recently adopted uh, mobile financial services like mobile money, digital credit. One of the um, biggest challenges when we survey these consumers um, is when they make an error, having to reverse a mobile money payment. And um, mobile money providers have whole entire customer care units just dedicated to that, doing 5,000 reversals a day. People make mistakes when they're learning. Digital cryptocurrencies are irreversible and anonymous. So do I wanna put this in the hands of new users and have 5,000, um, you know, they fat finger a six instead of a five, I have 5,000 transactions I can't get back? No. Um, also, it's anonymous and unregulated. And I firsthand, when I lived in Kenya, um, dealt with people who were defrauded by these Bitcoin investment clubs. They brought them in, they you know, gave them the sales pitch, the people spent their entire life savings and they had, they owned some, some crypto. It went up 2016, started to go down, they wanted out. They literally were not allowed to remove it. I went to the office address given. It was a fake office. I reached out to the regulators I work with in Kenya, nothing they could do. I found a name looking around of someone in Brazil in this crypto community, reached out to people I knew under different pretenses, found their number, reached out, nothing. This is what I'm talking about. This is why, you know, do crypto if you want to do crypto. It is not a tool for financial inclusion. The risk is not worth it. We have other innovations. ID, we have tiered KYC regimes. You can open without an ID in several countries right now. We are opening up licenses for payment service aggregators, third-party service providers. That's happening. I just don't think this is worth investing in as an inclusion tool. It's great for countries like Venezuela where currency is manipulated. It's great for remittances, but it's not a financial inclusion tool. Thank you, Ray, for some very strong points of view there. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll, of course, note that the design question of whether uh, cryptocurrency is anonymous or pseudonymous, which most of them actually are, they are pseudonymous, uh, is a critical point. And there are several distinctions that can be made in the design to ensure that there are more or less uh, places you can go to kind of determine who holds some of these assets. And in fact, uh, as we move to Danilo for our next intervention, we're going to hear from an environment in which um, the cryptocurrency law in El Salvador was passed uh, to be legal tender in that country uh, because it was perceived, uh, apparently, and we'll hear more on this from Danilo, that this was, it could be actually a means of everyday use uh, for payments. So Danilo, we'll turn it over to you to talk to us about the historical case of this law. Uh, and also what are the gaps in the law in El Salvador? How should we think about it in a holistic way? Over to you. Muchas gracias. Eh, en septiembre, el año pasado entró en vigencia la ley, ya llevamos algunos meses en su implementación. Nadie niega que en el mundo está creciendo el mercado de las criptomonedas, pero creo que se va evidenciando siempre la desigualdad financiera. Eh, el hecho que El Salvador tenga esa ley no significa que los consumidores ahora, por tanto, tienen mejores condiciones de vida. Estamos encontrando problemas. Eh, fraude a los consumidores, robo de identidad. Se regalaron 30 dólares para que bajaran los consumidores la aplicación, la Chivo Wallet. Y... Toda la gente metió sus datos de identidad, pero se robaron los datos de identidad en muchos consumidores. Se robaron los 30 dólares y gente que ha depositado en la Chu Wallet está perdiendo dinero. Ese es uno de los grandes problemas que tenemos en este momento. Tenemos la protección de datos con grandes problemas. El gobierno tuvo que cambiar a la empresa creadora en los Estados Unidos que empezó a crear toda esta idea y la ha, y la ha cambiado. Hay riesgos que están a la vista. Riesgos futuros. Lavado de dinero. 
los paraísos fiscales, la volatilidad del mundo de las criptomonedas, cómo cambia. Lo que estamos viendo en el conflicto Rusia-Ucrania, cómo ha cambiado el precio. Entonces yo creo que esta es una gran oportunidad para los que tienen dinero, porque pueden darse el lujo de invertir en criptomonedas y esperar que el dinero que suba el valor. Pero en el caso nuestro, en nuestro país o en nuestros países de Latinoamérica, nosotros ganamos para comer y no para estarnos dando el lujo de estar haciendo inversiones, tipo lo que estaba diciendo mi antecesor. Ahí me quedo. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Daniel. Thank you so much for telling us more about this historic law in El Salvador. And it's been really interesting to see uh, world leaders uh, start to chime in. Uh, we had an executive order from President Biden here in the United States. Uh, we have the new incoming president in South Korea talking about how he wants to have a big push and focus uh, on this topic and, and figure out how to uh, make Korea really a, a center of innovation in this space. I think the same thing is what the president of the United States is looking to do. So we are seeing a lot of attention being paid by world leaders uh, of, of really pretty significant economies to this new innovation. Uh, so how do we, uh, how do we, how do we split the baby as it were? How do we differentiate between high risk crypto assets, which certainly exist? Uh, how do we protect against some of the uh, fraudulent or maybe even malevolent or malicious actors who are trying to engage in activity that is uh, antisocial is how I kind of would frame it in the broad way uh, versus the more um, kosher, shall we say, uses of cryptocurrency, uh, which we are starting to see. I think that the remittance corridor, for example, that Rafe mentioned is proving to be quite a critical locus of new innovation in this space. I think we are seeing tremendous usage uh, in the play to earn spaces in ASEAN, all over the ASEAN countries. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity in wallet holders um, in, from all different kinds of demographic backgrounds now. It used to be this really was a young person's technology and opportunity. Now we're seeing um, older folks really get into this and start to take it more seriously. So the reality is that there are more and more, the adoption curve is showing, there are more and more people engaging with cryptocurrency, with blockchain technology. And I think someone made a very important distinction. I think it was you, uh, Yu Kyung, that the technology is distinct from the applications built on top of it, of course. Uh, and so I guess I, I, maybe I'll start with you, Sean. You know, how do you think about differentiating these high-risk assets or this more high-risk activity, let's call it, uh, for maybe more mundane or um, at this point fully realized behavior? I, I think there needs to be a realization that uh, not crypto are all the same. And also there's a notion of cryptocurrency and digital currency that, are all, that also exists in the, in the world today. Uh, cryptocurrencies today are tend to be higher risk um, assets. That that is very true. Uh, as if uh, as with any new asset classes that are coming into the markets, uh, certain volatility are are are, aim, are are certainly going to be there in place. Uh, but also, there's probably not enough policies and procedures uh, around these technologies and these new assets uh, that are that are you know uh, properly protecting the the general uh, audience as well. I agree with that. I think uh, in time uh, that will come. I mean, think about this, right? This technology has been only around for about 10 years and it's only been more vibrant in the last probably three or four years. So if you think about the, the notion of, uh, you know, having a very mature industry around it, that's just not, not the case at the moment. So, so it, will, it will come in time. But I, I want to go back to also this notion that I, I talked about in the, in the beginning, right? There's cryptocurrency and there is also digital currency. And if you think about digital currency, then many countries are in the process of either coming up with their own private um, you know, stable, stable coin, uh, mostly in the US dollar at the moment, uh, but also there are CBDCs that are being uh, designed and investigated, and in some cases rolled out uh, within, uh, within their domestic market and also the international market as well. So if you look at it from all of those perspectives, then there are a lot of developments that are really trying to look across the different dimensions of digital currency and trying to bring some clarity in terms of how all of that can work so that it's not all leaning towards the, the risky asset, which is the cryptocurrencies in general today, but also more across the board 
uh, that are um, that that are made available. So so I think the the opportunity is there for policymakers, for institutions, for consumers, all of us uh, to think about you know where all, where are all of these going and how do we actually interact with it so that we can learn more, but at the same time contribute more. You know, into the into the next kind of the, the future directions in in terms of where all of this are going. I'd love to hear from others on the panel. Perhaps uh, Bennett, I'll call on you. Yeah, um, I mean, the way I've seen it so far, I haven't seen really any kind of everyday uses of crypto so far. Um, I've I when it when it comes to something like um, the the cross border remittances. My experience with the cross-border remittances is that when you dig underneath the, the surface a little bit, it's not that kind of peer-to-peer -peer transfer that Sheila laid out in the introduction. It's not one person and one person with nothing in between. Often there's a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions, and uh, of varying degrees of protections and, uh, and regulations behind them. I mean, when, and so what that leads me to think is that as of right now, I can't speak for the future, but as of right now, it's not really disintermediation that Sheila was talking about, but rather reintermediation of new uh, intermediaries coming in to facilitate these kinds of, of uh, transactions. And, and to, uh, to emphasize that point, I'll just say that I, I don't think that more than five mining pools have ever controlled all of Bitcoin. So that's the, so not to get too uh, too technical on it, but mining pools are are how you get how you facilitate transactions more or less. No more than five mining pools have ever controlled all of Bitcoin, and for something like Ethereum, no more than two have ever controlled all of Ethereum. So it's not that kind of decentralization that people are touting when it comes to cryptocurrencies, but rather recentralization around new actors from what I've seen so far. Sean, I'm going to go back to you because I know uh, in your former role as the CEO of Elgrand Foundation, there are many examples of peer-to-peer -peer exchange and, and other uses, and I'd love for you to provide some of those if you could. Yeah, uh, certainly. I, I think, uh, first of all, the, the, there's a certain uh, truth to what Bennett is saying, right? So, so I, I, do want to, I, I do want to admit to that. Uh, there's not enough clarity around various different type of applications that are made available today that are so-called based on crypto uh, that are as transparent and as clear as uh, as they should be. So I, I do agree with that. Now, with that said, though, uh, there are lots of uh, applications where uh, you can you can actually see where the the more truer notion of peer-to-peer -peer payment is made available. Uh, I, I go back to the example that uh, Dante was using earlier, right? Uh, seeing he, him him from Circle. You know, if you're sending a, uh, a, a US dollar stable coin uh, from one wallet to the other, uh, very often you are going through the platform that are supplying the wallet technology, but it is more or less, <clears throat> it is more or less going from one wallet to another. And more importantly, I think most of us think about peer-to-peer -peer payments from a domestic standpoint and domestic, it's actually much easier to do. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, I, I live here in Hong Kong. We have this thing called the, the Fast Payment Network. Uh, it is mandated by the Monetary Authority of Hong Kong, and it basically connects all the banks together where we can just basically use one mobile phone and I can transmit from HSBC to Citibank to Standard Charter. So that type of thing is already made available, but it's still made very much in a domestic sense. Uh, when you talk about international remittances and when you're talking about transferring um, you know, sort of value from one uh, from from one jurisdiction to another, then crypto technologies and many of the applications, especially in the stablecoin senses, um, are starting to make that available. Now, is that it, you know, is it as peer to peer, point A to point B, uh, you know, a, as we want it to be? No, like I said, I mean, this technology it's all still fairly new, but the direction is indeed going to towards um, uh, the, the 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 process. Is definitely going in that direction. So, so I think there is definitely a lot of hope that newer innovation and more applications and more companies going into this space is definitely going to drive it in the right direction. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be as um, uh, as, as pushed back in, in terms of you know whether crypto remittances and payment processing are are just the same as traditional finance. I would say 
you know, and for sure that is not the case. Uh, it's just not all the way onto kind of where we wanted to be at the moment, but we're getting there. Rafe, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, if you want to chime in here. You are on mute. God, that keeps happening. Um, about this higher or lower risk and differentiation, I guess my question, so cryptocurrency, the innovation is decentralization, anonymization, and freedom, right? And so if we're going to, so who's going to, distinguish higher or lower risk, who's going to have punitive measures? Are you gonna create a ratings agency that is self-governed? Because then you're, you're getting away from what I think was the innovation, right? That it's, it's free, it's open, it's democratized. And you're basically just creating another financial supervision mechanism of another, you know, another you know, currency market. And so I don't really, if you have to start doing that, then I mean, why are we creating this? Why aren't we just improving the existing financial system, improving interoperability, right? Some of what you talk about sounds like Visa, MasterCard, sounds like SWIFT. Um, you know, when I look at the remittance case, I see a market failure because of cartels, bank cartels and, pay, uh, and you know, remittance cartels in these markets. And I think it's great that this workaround has happened and it's putting competitive pressure, but I just, I'm always confused you know, I don't, you, I don't get the sense you want like true proper financial regulation, but self-regulation never works in financial services. Look at the mortgage-backed securities. I can sell you some from 2008 that had an A rating, you know? I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't really, it feels like that's changing what the whole point of crypto was um, from my sort of relatively naive understanding. Well, I think I can certainly speak on behalf of a big part of the industry when I say that there is a lot of openness to regulation. I think recognition that regulation is actually critical to ensure that some of the opportunities presented by blockchain technology and by some cryptocurrencies, which to Sean's point are hardly monolithic, very far from, uh, I think are preserved and protected and that this is used as a tool of empowerment of consumers. And whether you come at that, I think, it's interesting is the different perspectives that lead to different actors in the crypto ecosystem to that conclusion. Some come from the sort of freedom, liberty, you know, standpoint where they're very much about the inability, wanting the inability of government to shut off their ability to transact, but to make sure that those transactions can be done in a safe way. All the way over to others of us in the ecosystem who are very concerned about those who have been historically excluded from legacy technologies and legacy financial system. And I think to your question, Rafe, about why don't we try to improve that system, I guess I would just kind of point, I think the question answers itself. I think there's been a lot of attempts to innovate in that space in ways that do address some of the historical exclusion, not many of which have been particularly successful, particularly when you consider global actors. But I think that your points are a very great seg over, I, I'd love to turn to you, Yukang. I know you'd mentioned earlier in your intervention, you wanted to speak about specifics and, and some of the ways that we could actually take action to provide a, a combination of consumer protection and also empowerment within the system. So we'd love to hand it over to you to speak about Can I just say one thing though? Please. Yes, go Literally ahead. Literally hundreds of millions of new accounts have been created in the past decade through payments innovations. That's, so you can't, that's not fair to say that hasn't done it. We're not there on inclusion, but I'm gonna, if I'm betting on what gets someone, you know, in, um, in the rural area in Africa or Asia gets them included, I'm gonna bet more on that than on crypto. I, that's why I think crypto is fine for what it does, but I don't, I think asking it to be financial inclusion, when I wanna hammer a nail, I don't grab a paintbrush. And I don't think that's, it's the right thing. I think that's a, I think that's a very fair point of view. And I I'm, I'm appreciate we have a diversity of perspectives on this panel. Uh, I'd love to get into specifics though, Yu Kyung, and just talk about some ways, given that I think we all also agree that crypto is, uh, an, a, whether it's a coming tsunami or whether it's more of a, an exciting wave, I think depends on your perspective. Nevertheless, we are seeing uh, more and more adoption around the world. And therefore, I personally feel there's quite a bit of urgency to make sure we get the policy environment right so that we don't uh, open up a lot of folks to uh, you know, illicit behavior. We don't allow the example that you talked about, Rafe, to be the dominant example uh, in the space, which 
I would argue it currently is not. Nevertheless, those possibilities exist. So you can let's hand it over to you to just speak to, again, some actions or specifics or other points that you have here around the kinds of regulations that really could be most beneficial in this space to protect consumers and empower them within this ecosystem. So um, just speaking from, again, from Korea, looking at the um, crypto as an investment asset, we would like, um, I think the most urgent thing is like regulating it like a, like a securities, like I, I understand the crypto industry might not think it as a securities, it, they, they might resist um, regulation, but I feel like the investors, um, the consumers, if they think that it's like an investment and they, they behave like it's an investment, then I think that um, we should have like a securities like um, regulation to deal with the issues of information asymmetry, market manipulation, uh, lack of transparency, lack of information that uh, exists in the market. And also, um, yeah, we ha I think we should also treat it as like a um, consumer financial product. So in the US, it would be something like the CFPB like regulator looking into it and looking at the specific um, sales methods, how the um, crypto is, is sold, marketed to the consumers. Um, and, but, but I was also wondering like, um, if we introduce this type of a regulatory regime, like how do we define the per ter perimeter of regulation? So should we leave off the high risk speculative cryptos and um, regulate just the more stable, uh, more, I guess, like kosher investments as you, uh, um, cryptos, as you said. And um, another like actually big question is, the, can the crypto industry endure this type of a financial regulatory, costly, complex compliance regime that we have for traditional financial regulation? Um, I'm really skeptical, skeptical. I've never seen an industry saying that we're so happy to have um, regulation in this space. Um, I've never seen it in financial regulation. I'm really um, interested to see um, how the industry response is, especially um, with regards to the um, Biden executive order, or we see in the EU too, that we see regulations that are similar to securities like regulations um, that are being introduced in the space. Thank you. Bennett, I'll hand it over to you, and then I'm going to turn some, to some audience questions. So Bennett, take it away. Yeah, I'm just going to add a little bit. I, I understand that that a lot of this understanding around blockchain is presented as very new. Uh, the fact is blockchains have been around since the 90s. Um, the Bitcoin itself has been around since 2008, which to me seems right just around the corner, but that's actually coming up on 15 years ago. Um, M-Pesa came out the same time and has completely changed the lives of everyday Kenyans and, and really actually succeeded at providing financial inclusion. And it's in part because they do things like they require a one-to-one -one ratio for every shilling that they put in the, uh, into the economy, they have one shilling sitting in a bank account somewhere. For the stable coins and other liquidity providers inside of the, uh, inside of the, um, in, inside of the cryptocurrency space, I would be surprised if they were open to that kind of a regulation. If they are, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to hear it, but that kind of one-to-one -one ratio for stable coins, which would actually provide stability and transparency inside of the economy, I'd be surprised if they were actually open to that. I can confirm that many of them are. <laughs> it's in part my job to know what they are thinking about that particular topic. Uh, I think it varies. I think that one of the reasons that you're seeing a lot of openness to certain kinds of regulation, I think Yukong's point is a very is a very well taken one. It's it's it depends on who you ask in the ecosystem. And again, I think the number one takeaway should be this is hardly a monolithic ecosystem. The offerings are not monolithic. They differ very significantly. The differences between Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, in the context of consumer usage are significantly different. And I also think that the appetite for regulation is quite different depending on where you are in the world and who you are. It's worth noting that exchanges in the US are highly regulated already. Uh, they are already subject to OFAC rules, they're already subject to the BSA. There are a lot of different things that they fall under and we're seeing encroaching, I don't know if that's the right word, we're seeing expanded um, uh, scope for engagement with this executive order. So the expectation of US 
uh, headquartered entities is that they are going to be subject to a regulation that is more appropriate for decentralized um, actors, but that is reflective of the current regime that does exist in the United States around financial institutions and others. And I know, Sean, if maybe you want to speak a little bit about what's happening in Asia, which there is some similarity there, I think, in Singapore and other places, but there's certainly a growing recognition on the part of policymakers and regulators that this is an area uh, worthy of attention. It is becoming a bigger and bigger industry. And I think we're seeing more and more cooperation over time. And I think that's true at a global level. But Sean, I'll turn it to you to speak a bit about maybe um, what's happening in Asia around regulation and policy. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the the every player in the crypto industry or blockchain industry knows that regulation is inevitable, right? Uh, and, and many of us that are in the technology space have seen it over and over again. Uh, you know, in the 90s, you had the internet. And I, I remember there were, I'm old enough to, to remember that there were many peers at the time that, that called the internet to be completely decentralized information sharing. Uh, and then when you go into, you know, kind of the e-commerce phase, you go into social media, then you go into cloud computing. And there were many, many people uh, that were putting up, up, up in arms uh, about how these new technologies are going to be, you know, breaking the existing rules of today. Uh, now we see, you know, 20 years, 30, 20, 30 years later, how the industry has evolved, how policy uh, makers have caught up, how the industry by itself is also, you know, trying to bring themselves more into the middle where there are now a very established data sovereignty rules, data privacy rules uh, for information that are acting in the cloud and so on and so forth. So I, I would just say that, you know, this is a, it's a process, right? Uh, we, we, we are sitting here at this moment in time in the beginning of 2022, uh, looking at where crypto is today. And we're saying, oh, well, it's not this and it's not that. I agree. Uh, many of those things are very true. At this point, they are not those yet. Uh, but it takes all of us to really think about ways that can that can actually make it there, right? Uh, it, Thirty years ago, if we just kept saying there, you know, the internet is just this some 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 scam where some network where where people are just sending information back and forth and and no regulation in terms of you know who it is and what they are. Well, then we're not going to be where we are today. So so I think if we keep an open mind. Uh, and, and many in the crypto industry, and I can say this for a fact uh, as well, seeing, seeing I, I, I am in the industry, that we are very open to regulation. Now, what I'll say one more point. What many in the crypto industry are worried about, however, is that you have very, very drastically different regulation from one part of the world to another. And that makes it very hard, right? Think about the internet again. Internet is global. Crypto is global. A lot of these per public permissionless blockchain are global. So when you have one part of the regulation which is in completely opposite to another, that makes it very difficult for players to, to conform. And that makes it even harder. I mean, this is a consumer rights day, right? Uh, that makes it even harder for the consumer to really understand where things are going. So it really takes all of us right, on, on any side uh, to really come to come to the middle, to try to figure out what are some of those po possible applications, what are po some of those possible regulations and policies that are healthy, um, and 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 really trying to take uh, push this thing forward. Uh, I, I agree, there are existing technologies out there today that can solve a lot of problems. That's why they exist. Um, but there, are there better ways to do things? Maybe they are. Right? It, it takes all of us to try to get to that point. Thank you. So I'll turn to audience questions. And uh, there are some questions I'm just going to ask panelists to respond to in the chat. For example, someone has asked, uh, what is literature that others might, uh, those might read, you know, that we would recommend if they're looking to educate themselves a bit more. So I'll invite panelists rather than spending our airtime there to put some uh, links or other things into the chat and I will do the same. Uh, we had a whole paper when I was at the forum on consumer protection, really walking through what kinds of regulations would be most effective, uh, particularly at a global level um, and, and most impactful in terms of consumer protection. So I'll put that chat in there as well. But there's a question uh, here, uh, that is about um, what are positive examples of, of tokenization? Uh, or is just the act of tokenizing something a way to bypass the regulations that exist around capital raises? 
which is an interesting question. And so I wonder um, if somebody wants to respond to that. Sean, you're probably the best person to talk through positive examples uh, of tokenization. I'll offer one, which is we have seen um, in the standpoint of governance tokens uh, that are really used to provide weighted voting in different systems. There were a couple of cities in the United States, Berkeley being, I think, I believe the first uh, the city in Berkeley, California, that used governance tokens to basically allow people to uh, weigh in on what the municipality ought to focus on in terms of city improvements, which road should be fixed or what park needed to be you know, spruced up or, or whatnot. Uh, some of those governance tokens did wind up having liquidity on a secondary market. That was not the goal, but I do think there are several examples. That's just one example of, of the governance models around this being quite powerful as a way to provide stakeholder engagement within a system. Uh, so I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in to give other examples of um, positive examples of tokenization models. Okay, I will assume my my response uh, handled that one. Uh, another question that we uh, were asked is, uh, as crypto is a non-reversible transaction, which is uh, correctly understood, how does this work in the case of fraud or IP infringements? I'm going to ask that we not go down the whole NFT rabbit hole because that is the topic that is they could have its own panel around it. Uh, but I think the question really here is, is there consumer protection given that these are irreversible transactions or could there be existing frameworks for TradFi regulation applied in the same way? So I believe the question is asking, could we port existing consumer protection principles or even existing regulation over into the crypto space to provide that protection for this sort of irreversible transaction? I know some of you touched on this topic, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the regulation part of this and if those regulations uh, are sufficient in this new ecosystem. Does anybody want to take this one? I'm sorry, before we respond to that, can I just yeah. kind of, can I... Uh, can I talk to, about the governance tokens for just a second? Please, of course, yes. It, it just frightens me when we start going down the road of governance tokens for things like, like fixing roads and things like that, because a lot of them are based on whoever has the most tokens gets the most say. And when you talk about things like these things, the, the tokens having value in um, uh, um, secondary markets, you're talking about being able to buy people's votes and buy governance from other people, which is is exacerbating, it really runs the risk of exacerbating a massive problem in society today, which is inequality. And, and I don't know how you get over these issues of inequality when it comes to a lot of these cryptocurrency uh, systems. The, the Gini coefficient on them is far worse than any country in the world. So I'm just going to say that governance token, I understand that it's it, it might be a positive thing. It scares the heck out of me. I'll respond to that because I think what Berkeley found was that the secondary market was the problem. So governance tokens were issued to people and kind of a one person, one vote sort of model. And the ability to provide a secondary market was something that hadn't necessarily been, I don't want to speak too much to this experiment and, and shine too broad a light there because it was a very tiny experiment and there are other ones that were done uh, subsequently. It just happened to be one of the very first. Uh, but the idea was that relegating and keeping these as governance tokens only where there was no security aspect or liquidity on a secondary market was actually critical to ensuring that we weren't just allowing the wealthiest to buy as many tokens as they wanted to and basically buy the vote. So I think it's an excellent Excellent point. It's something I actually raised in the feedback I gave that whole project. It's something I know Sean's done a bunch of work on and many others who think a lot about um, democratization and democracy within these systems. Uh, but this is a critical distinction made by the SEC, right? Governance tokens versus security tokens is a fundamentally critical distinction. And even the Security Exchange Commission has recognized that these are not the same thing. So uh, the question was, are there positive examples of tokenization? The answer, I believe, is yes in the governance context, but not if those are then ported over to become essentially security tokens that then are used for capital raise. And so you kind of got to break apart the question, Javier, that you asked. And I think that it is important to understand the distinction drawn between governance tokens and security tokens and how the two occasionally merge, but are seen as quite distinct by many regulators. But to go to the other question I was asking, or this, that was asked by this uh, individual, this anonymous attendee, 
maybe Bennett, you can address that. I believe you're on mute. Sorry, can you repeat the question real quick? The, yeah, um, it's in the Q and A. It's the second okay. question Q and A, and the question uh, is: Because crypto is irreversible, can traditional regulation in the consumer protection arena be used to protect consumers in this context? I mean, it's a very good question. I don't know. I, like most of my work has been in um, in in places like Kenya um, and uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa where um, one of the things that I dealt with as a, um, we, we set up a, uh, a merchant payments network where we were one of the first, I, I was, we were the front, one of the first people to set up coffee shops and bars and auto parts stores with the ability to accept digital payments. And the reason why we had a job was because of the problems that companies were having with this reversibility issue that like, that that people were coming in, they would buy something, walk out, and then get it reversed, or maybe they couldn't get it reversed. And so, so my company was was a uh, um, was allowing was allowing businesses to transact more easily on a digital payment system, which was M-Pesa. Now we were a middleman. We 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 stood in between the companies and M-Pesa, which was the uh, which was the payment system. And then the consumer. So there. So now there's four parties in that model. Um, that's intermediation. And so when you start talking about making these things happen more easily, you're you're talking about bringing in more middlemen, which kind of goes against that whole idea that you put forward at the beginning, which was a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Um, and so I don't know how you square that circle. I think we are almost at time, but I see a lot of hands raised. So Yu Kyung, I'm gonna to go to you. So I just have one um, comment. So based on our con complaints review of the, um, of the cryptos uh, exchanges in Korea, is that a lot of the um, um, complaints were about refunds. They, they wanted refunds and it, it involved a lot of the middlemen. Like I sent money to somebody, but the somebody um, took away the money and how can I get my refund? So it, it, I think it's just not a theoretical question, but it's like very, very important questions that a lot of investors are facing right now in Korea. Danilo, I see you have a hand up. Would love to hear from you as our final comment before we wrap. Hablaré despacio. Eh, yo sí creo que hay varias y muchas experiencias en el mundo y estamos avanzando en la digitalización financiera. Pero necesitamos como organizaciones de consumidores, al menos desde Consumers International, tratar de incidir en el tema de la regulación. Y segundo aspecto, Tenemos que tener más evidencia científica o técnica de los problemas que se están dando en el mundo para trasladar la información a los líderes mundiales que den elementos para la regulación. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Danilo. Well, we could go on for another half hour, hour or more. I know with this excellent panelist with uh, some very, very feisty conversation, which I very much appreciate. I think you've heard that this is an area of ongoing focus. It's an area of ongoing concern. It's also an area of ongoing adoption. And so I think it falls upon all of us to ensure that the policies and regulations that will comprise the enabling environment in which crypto is adopted, in which blockchain, te blockchain technology and Web3 uh, begin to thrive, 
uh, is one that is very focused on consumer protection and empowerment, is focused on individuals and communities, is focused on those who have not been well served by existing systems, and that we look to focus our attention on what we can learn from the existing systems, what we can learn from existing regulation, what parts of that we need to bring over into the crypto ecosystem, what parts we maybe could even improve upon in terms of providing consumers avenues for whether it's uh, recourse or whether it's um, opportunities to, to combine and engage in systems that could provide uh, powerful um, opportunities while mitigating the clear challenges that also exist. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much to Consumers International for creating a space for us to have this important conversation. Thank you to all of you for lively engagement in the chat. And please do continue to engage in Consumers International. Uh, there, you can see here how to engage with the group. There's many opportunities to do so. And this is not the end. I think this is the beginning of some more conversations that we'll be having together on this topic of fair digital finance. Thank you so much for your time today.